Well, thank you for joining us today. We'll go ahead and begin our presentation on the SBIR, Small Business Innovation Research Program. In this program today, you're going to learn about how the SBIR program works and the benefits of it to your project. Before we kick off, we'd like to have Mike Breck talk a little bit about the Small Business Development Corporation who's bringing us this program today. Mike? Thanks, Hall. Uh, we want to welcome everybody on to the call here today. Uh, I know that we have people, I think, from around the country that are joining this call and want to welcome all of you no matter where you come from. Um, small Business Development Centers, I'm with the Texas State Small Business Development Centers, but Small Business Development Centers uh, are uh, found throughout the United States, so no matter where you are listening from, there is a Small Business Development Center that would be in your geographical area. Uh, basically, we are a net nationwide network of small business advisors working with small businesses and helping them grow and establish themselves. Uh, we are funded through federal and state tax dollars, so because of that, uh, our services are provided at no charge to clients, which is a nice thing. Um, here in Central Texas, uh, we with the Texas State Small Business Development Center have taken a particular interest in supporting SBIR, STTR program. Um, we are actually involved in training uh, to, do, to be official mentors for companies which are preparing uh, for the SBIR program for uh, filling out their applications and, and getting, uh, you know, getting that set up correctly. Uh, so because of that, we are very happy uh, to host this webinar. Uh, I hope that this will be a, a uh, session that for all of our attendees that you'll get a lot out of. Uh, I know one of the things we're driving this towards is that coming up here in November, there is a national SBIR, SDTR conference here in Austin. It's an outstanding opportunity. I know the bulk of the people on this call are from Texas, uh, and it is, uh, it is an honor to be able for, uh, to, for people here in the state of Texas to host the event. And uh, I hope that as a result of this phone call that a lot of you who are listening will be motivated to sign up and uh, attend the conference. Um, that's pretty much uh, uh, what I want to say at this point. I think that I'd like to be able to get to our uh, our main speaker, Alan, as quickly as possible. So once again, just let me welcome you. Uh, we're glad that you are participating on this phone call. And Hall, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, Mike. So our speaker today is Robert Allen Baker. He's speaking on behalf of the Department of Navy's SBIR, STTR program, and also this the Fall National SBIR conference that's coming up here soon. Robert Allen Baker has more than 25 years of experience in advanced technology commercialization with an emphasis on system-based approaches to technology integration, program planning, management. He's increasingly in the defense arena and related policy formation, program health management, and the commercialization process improvements ensuring best practices. Uh, Mr. Baker developed these skills in Silicon Valley industry in the 1980s and then honed them further in extensive uh, client applications with federal agencies and local and regional governments. With that, I'd like to turn it over to our speaker today, Robert Allen, and talk to us more about the SBIR program, what it is, and how it works. Thank you, Hall, and uh, welcome everybody to the webinar this afternoon. Hall, would you go to the next slide, please? Um, commercialization is a, is a word that might not be in the vocabulary of all of you on the phone, but for those of us that are in the SBIR community, commercialization is an everyday word. Congress gave us this word, actually. SBIR is a congressionally authorized program. It's one of the things that Congress absolutely has done right, and when Congress reauthorized the Small Business Innovation Research Program and its companion program, STTR, um, it focused on commercialization. and Congress in the legislation gave us a pretty clear definition of what co commercialization means. And I'll just read directly from the slide, but you all should feel free to come back to this as well. So commercialization is the process of developing products, processes, technologies, or services, and the production and delivery of these. In other words, commercialization covers an awful lot of territory. It starts with invention, and it ends up with customers. Let's go to the next slide, please. 
So here's what commercialization looks like, at least world according to me. I may not be the world's best artist, but I've seen this landscape um, over and over again over the past 25 years. And it hasn't changed very much, quite frankly. It's one that's probably familiar with most of you all. So at the far left, we've got a lonely inventor who's got a great idea. And he or she has a technology that they think is capable of changing the world. And they know that somewhere out there on the far end of the horizon, there is a customer for that technology. And best of all possible worlds, there's not just one customer. There will be a million customers scattered over all the world. And lo and behold, this technology that the inventors developed will change the world. But the problem is, boy, there's a lot of territory that you've got to cross. <clears throat> and it's rough territory to get from the invention all the way over to developing the product, getting it into the market pipelines and into the hands of customers. And that long journey not only takes time, but it costs a lot of money. Um, I've seen some technologies that have been fully productized and delivered in the hands of customers for as little as $2 million. But I'll tell you what, frankly, you know, most of them are somewhere north of 6 or $7 million, And I've seen technologies that cost as much as 100 million in the developmental process before they, they struck gold uh, and put their products in the hands of customers. So the question is, where does that money come from? And that's what I want to focus on today. Next slide, please. So that um, <clears throat> as entrepreneurs, uh, you all are pretty familiar, particularly with the Texas entrepreneurs who are, who are in the webinar here. You're very familiar with everything below that line that runs across horizontally from one end of this slide to the other, where we describe the basic um, developmental aspects of, uh, of, uh, techno of technology maturation, discovery, proof of concept, product design, product development, and manufacturing delivery. So you know, below that line, you'll see the conventional choices that are available to you. And I must say, in Texas, you all are fortunate. You have a substantial number of angels. You have substantial angel networks out there and angel groups. Um, you have venture funding organizations. You have institutional investors as well, and you have them in plenitude. I've been very impressed, and we in the SBR community are impressed, by the diversity of resources that are available in major locations like um, Austin and Houston and Dallas and Fort Worth and you know, all the way over to you know Waco and Lubbock. Um, Texas is rich in these. But um, our perspective is, it may not be enough money, and it may not be enough money in the time frame where you need it. And in that case, the Small Business Innovation Research Program is exactly a good choice for you. It's not an alternative. It's a complement and a supplement to the funding sources that are already out there. And our argument would be that as a $2.3 billion program, SBR can provide resources in the kind of quantity that you as an entrepreneur need. and where you need it and when you need it. Let's go to the next slide, please. <clears throat> so as you know, angel funds uh, provide the majority, 90% of the outside equity for startups. And I've put together this pretty simple slide here just so you can take a side-by-side -side, um, look at uh, what angels do and what venture capitalists do. These are national numbers. Uh, they're cumulative over 2014. So you know these numbers are kind of a work in progress. Since we're not done with calendar 14 um, yet. And what's interesting here is that, that the cumulatively, the dollar worth um, of the angel investor pool and the VC pool is you know, roughly the same. It's between 20 and $25 billion. The big difference, though, is in the number of deals that are done, which tells you that VC deals are, are not only much less frequent, but they're much higher numbers in terms of the amount of investment that's going to be made. Angel deals are much, much more common, as I'm sure you all um, know out there. And as we've seen, particularly in taking a deep dive into what's happened in Austin, um, angels provide a powerful jump start for a lot of entrepreneurs there. Let's go to the next slide, please. And I think, aha. So here, let me explain just briefly what the value proposition of SBIR is coming into um, the uh, coming into the funding mix. And I'm going to hone in directly on that red bullet point right smack in the middle. At $2.3 billion, this is a big chunk of change, a very big chunk of change. It's the largest federal program that's available to help small business inventors. But moreover, it's probably the largest single source of capital um, that's available in an efficient, efficient way. This money's been made available to more than 145,000 awardees since 1985. 
And over the past 10 years or so, um, SBIR awardees have been uh, earning about 10 patents a day that have been that have been granted to them year in and year out. Um, for innovation investors, uh, the the real value proposition of SBIR is it's non-diluted funding. Um, it's it's monies that you win on a competitive basis, um, and there's no equity scape that's that's attached to it. It's non-diluted funding. And it's designed to reduce the risk of developing your technologies, to accelerate the development of your technologies, and to preserve your IP rights um, for somewhere between five and eight years, depending on uh, which of the agencies that, um, that, that you work with. Um, Congress has had a passion for small business innovation. It's one of the three things, as I've said before, they've done absolutely right in supporting research and development all the way back to 1983 when <clears throat> when this program was born, followed by its uh, companion program, STTR, in 1992. Um, this is one of the few programs the federal government supports that is supported across the board by everybody in Congress, from people on the far right to people on the far left, in, uh, in both parties and independents included. SPBR, STTR reauthorization in 1911 or rather in 2011, was strongly supported by an overwhelming majority of members in Congress. It's not going away. This program is coming up for reauthorization in 2017, and we have every reason to believe that it will be increased yet again. So that the fall national SBIR and STTR conference that, uh, that Mike talked about before will occur in Austin, Texas, November 11th and 13th. Um, this is a portal. Um, for those of you who are entrepreneurs, to not just to get your feet wet in terms of SBIR, but to speak with large numbers of people from every agency in the federal government um, that offers an SBIR program. If you'll go to the website that I'm going to give you now, and I'm going to give it to you again at the end of the webinar, it's www.nationalsbirconference.com. National SBIR Conference is all one word, www.nationalsbirconference.com. And that website tells its own story about the value of this conference and all the things that are going to be offered there. Let's go to the next slide, please. <clears throat> this is a build slide here. So SBR is a three-phase competitive program. The first phase, roughly six months, $150,000. This is primarily designed for to establish the feasibility of, of your prospective invention of the idea that you've got and that you're hoping to develop into an actual product. Phase two uh, will starts with the, it, it's a full research um, <coughs> funding increment that will take you all the way through the development of what is in most cases in SBR awards a full scale working prototype of the um, um, of your invention. Um, this is about a million dollar award. Um, it'll cover a two year period of time. Um, phase three is what we describe as the goal of the program, where commercialization is is realized. Phase three is funded with non-SBIR money, and in the next coming slides you'll see you know, why phase three typically occurs and uh, why other R&D sources um, like to um, add their funding collaboratively and incrementally onto, onto SBIR awards. Let's go to the next slide. So this is an example of um, what the structure of the SBR and STTR program. I just happen to have chosen a slide from the Department of the Navy. I'm going to follow it just with example slides so you can see what the National Science Foundation looks like and what NASA looks like. The programs are roughly the same, even though you know the templates might look a little different in terms of how the funding is laid out. But this shows you, if you go from left to right, phase one, um, it shows that uh, basically what we do here is to provide a base payment and then an option payment, and that's to make sure that you don't have time without money as you proceed through phase one and you work your way into the competition for phase two. In phase two, generally it's the same process of a base payment um, once you've won the award, the competitive award, um, followed by one or, or more options. And you can see that um, over, the, the, at least in at this particular slide, Cumulatively, the amount of money that you can accrue through phase two the first time around is a little bit more than a million dollars in SBR and STTR funding. Now, that being said, um, the topics that you're going to respond to in many cases come, in the case of the Department of Defense, 
in many cases, these topics come from acquisition programs. And it's those sponsoring programs that have a primary interest in seeing um, your technology being successfully developed. And so in the phase two, option two, you'll see that we work with you to help go out and raise matching funds, which are non-SBIR monies that complement SBIR funding that significantly increase the amount of funding that's available. And the more money that you have in order to develop your technology, as you well know, the faster you're going to be able to develop and get it in the hands of customers. Now, one of the strengths of the SBIR program is that you can win a second phase two award. We've called it in this slide a subsequent phase two. And that can be um, as much as one and a half million dollars. Um, and with matching funds, it can be significantly more than that. So you can see if you look at the blue line that runs horizontally all the way across the bottom, in SBIR funding alone, um, over the life of a project, phase one to the end of phase two, you could be looking at the better part of $3 million. This is a significant amount of money. It's generally above what you'll be able to get from an angel investor. And it's done just on the strength of your competitive ability um, to be a smart engineer or a smart scientist. Phase three is described on the, on the right-hand side there. Um, and as I said, um, the, the R&D community that sponsors the topics has a material interest in more fully supporting, um, the fiscally supporting um, the technologies that you're developing under your SBIR award. And so they are the entities that will give you um, the, the phase three awards. One of the features of the SBIR program is that phase three contracts can be awarded without competition. Um, because you've, you, you, you completed the competition requirements of the SBIR and STTR program and that, we, uh, and that are baselines in the Department of the Navy and throughout the Department of Defense that we want to make sure that, that um, technology decisions are made on a competitive basis. SBIR satisfies those competitive requirements and that results in what's often known as the sole source. I'm not going to go down to the weeds into it because you'll learn a whole lot more about how this works in detail when you come to the National SBR Conference. Let's go to the next slide, please. Um, this is the National Science Foundation's model. Let's go to the next slide, please. And this is NASA's model. Again, the templates look very different from one another, but the story they tell is roughly the same. And once you've learned um, how to negotiate within one, with one agency, um, it's a lot easier to figure out how to negotiate the competitive process in all of the agencies. We'll tell you a lot more about that at the National SBR Conference. Next slide, please. So uh, this is a question that we get all the time. What kind of chances do I have of, uh, of winning an award? And there's an awful lot of entrepreneurs out there, particularly folks that come from rural areas or from inner cities, and maybe they didn't go to the best schools, but they still might be the smartest kids in the room. And so those people are very concerned that they're not going to be able um, to compete successfully. They have this idea in their minds that there are companies that win SBIR awards over and over and over again, and they crowd out. They, they take all the oxygen out of the room uh, for, uh, for newcomers. Well, it's exactly the opposite. So if you take a look at this slide, this happens to be information that comes from the Department of Energy. But if you look at the, at the green bar that runs um, horizontally in the bottom part of this chart, you'll see that about 20% of applicants um, uh, year in and year out um, are newcomers, are their first time applicants. What's even more dramatic is if you're one of those 20%, you have a really good chance of winning an SBR award. I mean, look at the difference between that. 20% of the first time applicants, um, or rather 20% of the, of the applicants are first timers. But up to 30 to 35% of the winners are first timers as well. So you have a very good chance of competing successfully for um, an SBIR award in any one of the 11 major agencies that offer SBIR programs. Next slide, please. Um, there are two components um, in an SBIR and STTR proposal, as we'll describe to you in much more detail if you're able to come to the National SBIR Conference in Austin in November. One piece of it is the technical proposal, and you all expect that you're going to have to describe in detail uh, what you as a scientist or an engineer are going to do in your phase one work and in your phase two work. Um, but we will also ask you to 
anticipate uh, the commercialization process by coming up with a good detailed commercialization plan. We're looking for more of an overview in the phase one proposal, but in your phase two proposal, we're going to ask you to spend a little bit more time looking in some detail. This is what the National Science Foundation um, is looking for by way of a commercialization plan in uh, the phase two application that you would submit um, to them. And without going into detail with this, as you look through the individual bullet points here, I think it becomes clear to you that what this amounts to, this is a business plan. Um, the difference is this is a short business plan. It doesn't take you six to nine months to develop. You don't have to go out and hire somebody <clears throat> to uh, help you develop that business plan. You're going to be able to do it yourself. Um, this will be a major step forward for you in advance of you developing the full-blown business plan. You probably will need to have as you proceed in through the productization process. And you may have to go out um, back to an institutional lender. Or you may have to go to an, SBC, an SBA um, program like SBIC or one of the other major loan programs. But SBIR is a way of taking you a major step forward um, and doing it rapidly all the way along the line with you as a scientist or an engineer on one hand and you as a business person on the other. We're going to grow your skills as a technician on one hand, a technologist, and as a business person, as a entre successful entrepreneur on the other. Next slide, please. Um, commercialization assistance is offered for free um, to uh, SBI or awardees in most of the federal agencies, most of the 11 agencies that uh, offer the SBR program. Um, Agencies will either offer phase one assistance, and I give you some examples here of commercialization readiness assessments uh, <clears throat> and the development, help in developing phase two commercialization plan. And that's generally what happens in phase one assistance. Phase two assistance is much meatier, much more substantive. Uh, allows you to get down way into the weeds in terms of commercialization strategies, in terms of providing you market research that's current and accurate and up-to-date. It's not like something you buy off the shelf that's two or three years old and is no longer relevant by the time you get your, um, your technology developed. It can even result in investor introductions. And more importantly, um, what you find now is that there are federal agencies like, for example, the Department of Energy that are just beginning to debut phase zero programs. You may know this. Uh, Texas is one of the states that has offered phase one, uh, zero programs in the past. Phase zero programs are designed to help those of you who are newcomers to the program develop successful and winning proposals the first time out of the box. Um, as the last bullet shows, of course, um, you, ha you have the right to select your own commercialization assistance vendor. Um, if you want, you don't have to accept the free continuing support that is offered by the agencies if, uh, if you don't want to do that. Let's go to the next slide, please. Uh, thank you. Um, in addition to SBIR, there are follow-on programs that are not SBIR that are complementary. And I've given you just one example here. Um, the Department of Defense offers a rapid innovation fund that is designed to satisfy an operational or a national security need. Um, it's about $3 million, maybe a little bit less than that, but not more than $3 million. You get um, two, uh, 24 months. Um, in order to accelerate or enhance a military capability in support of a major defense acquisition program, and then actually have that technology inserted in a deployed um, system. Selection preference in the Rapid Innovation Fund, the Rapid Innovation Program, does go to small businesses and encourages you to work with larger industry partners and with laboratory partners as well. It's just one of the add-on features to SBIR that SBIR is considered to be such an effective program for technology development that other programs um, like to take a look at SBIR winners and preferentially um, go to them because they've already proven themselves um, as winners. Let's go to the next slide, please. This is one of the slides that, um, that I like to be able to talk to and offer to you because um, as I say, this is a one-page, th 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 this is an innovator's business card. Uh, the quad chart is something you typically see within the Department of Defense. 
We use them in all kinds of programs, not just the SBIR program. But it's a quick and simple way of, of addressing and describing a technology and the value of that technology. And for those of you that are coming to the National SBIR Conference or are interested in coming, I would encourage you to do a variety of different pieces of homework and preparation to get the most out of that conference. And one of the things I would encourage you to do, if you don't have a one-page quad chart like this that focuses on your technology of choice, what you're best at, I'd suggest you develop it so you can bring it with you. Um, it's one thing to hand out a business card or to spend a couple minutes trying to talk your way through or fight your way through a pitch to explain your technology. How much more effective is it to give people a one-page business card like this that tells them everything they want to know about your technology? Let me just take 30 seconds and walk you through a quad chart. Upper left quadrant, here's a picture of the technology product. And it's relevant in terms of size. If you see the right-hand side of that picture, you can see people standing there. You see a laptop. That's in order to give you a sense of scale so you know this is something that's probably a piece of software. It's going to run on a laptop. It's not a refrigerator or something the size of a car. So you can see um, um, graphically size, weight, and uh, scope of, of, the, uh, of the technology product. In the quadrant directly below that in the lower left, that tells you what the customer's requirement set is that you have been addressing. Skip up to the upper right quadrant. That tells you how you are addressing the customer requirement with the product that you are developing, with the technology that you are developing. And skip to the lower right quadrant, and that tells you what operationally your solution looks like. Now, as I say, this is a piece of software right here. It's described accurately in the lower left in terms of what the customer requirement for has to do with self-training um, for commanders and tactical <clears throat> command skills by expanding uh, game-based training capabilities. Well, what the game-based training capabilities run on? Well, you know, they run on laptops. Or they run on portable, um, they run on mobile devices. And so what you see in the lower right, that's the graphic user interface. That's the GUI. So that tells a prospective customer everything they need to know to get the discussion started. And when you come to the National SBR Conference, that's going to be your goal. When you talk to one of the dozens of SBIR program people who are going to be there, you want to get right into a substantive conversation about where you can go with your technology. And so I'm going to credit Mike Breck with the uh, suggestion that he gave me before we started this webinar. I'm going to put together a 20-minute webinar as a follow-on to this one for anybody that's on the, uh, out of the 25 folks or so that are, that are watching this webinar here, we're going to make that webinar available to you. And I'm going to focus in on what kind of homework you need to do and what the most effective way to do it is. And I'll walk you through quad chart development in that webinar that's uh, coming up. Let's go to the next, uh, next chart, please. So here's the commercialization takeaways out of this slide. Uh, I'm going to read these. I hate reading slides, but in this case, it's important to, to get these points down. As an inventor, your priority has to be to identify customers for a technology that's adapted by you, and it has to meet their needs and requirements. It's wonderful to have great ideas, but at the end of the day, that great idea has to be married to, to a need and a requirement set that a customer has out there. So as an SBIR awardee, different kind of role, your priorities have to be to help fulfill a mission of the funding agency that gave you the award of the contract. <clears throat> and your priority has to be to leverage non-SPIR resources. I gave you some examples in this slide deck to mature your technology and accelerate the productization of it for those potential customers. Now, there's a different role you play. We talked about it before, and that's you're the manager of this growing small business. And as the small business principal, your priority has to be to fairly and accurately assess your strengths and your weaknesses in order to be able to build a team that allows you to aggressively market the invention that you have. Um, it's wonderful to be the smartest scientist or, or, or engineer in the room, but it's even better to have acquired the management skills so that you can assemble a team that's going to allow you to get your product um, to the finish line. And in many cases, you may not be the optimal CEO or the optimal COO within the company that you're beginning to build. But the SBR program will help you determine 
what kind of a team you need to build and how that team can be built over what period of time, how much it's going to cost, and where those resources are. And my last bullet, and forgive me, I mean, I'm not government, I'm a contractor, but I can't resist saying this. Yes, we are here to help you in this case. Let's go to the next slide, please. So uh, in this slide, uh, I'm not going to read any of these because you'll have access to these, um, uh, these references. But this is a great set of desk references um, for you to use. There are more references than this. Uh, but these four give you, uh, will allow you to get your feet wet at a very significant level in terms of what you need to know about the SBR and STTR program, about commercialization, about policy aspects of it. The only thing that I would add to this as a really useful resource is the same website that I gave you a few minutes ago. And that is the website that you're going to go to to find out more about the National SBIR Conference, which is www.nationalsbirconference.com. National SBIR Conference is all one word. Next slide. Well, there we have it. Questions? Great. For those who are not familiar with our, our system, there's a questions box on the right-hand side. Feel free to type in your questions there, and we'll do our best to answer them. Uh, uh, several have come in while Alan was speaking. Alan, thank you for that presentation. And one of the questions we have is, how, how long is the process from the time they start to the time they get accepted? What's the average time for that? Um, it varies from agency to agency, and what I'd like to do is to kick questions like that over to my colleague, Dr. Jeanette Hill, because I know that she plans to address um, some of those in uh, the presentation that she's going to give. One of the things I like best about this webinar is that the SBDC people wanted to begin to bring um, somebody that I'm sure that some of the people on this, uh, on this webinar know. Yeah, um, Spot On Sciences is a pretty well-known, successful SBIR company and award winner, and I think that Jeanette's going to be able to address some of these things. So if we may, um, let's, uh, I'm, I'm, yes, I mean, I'll answer any questions that are here, but um, I don't want to steal Jeanette's thunder because she's actually been there and done that successfully and can answer it better than I can. Great. Jeanette, uh, we have with us Dr. Jeanette Hill. She's the founder and CEO of Spot on Sciences and has more than 20 years of experience in pharmaceutical research. She received a Ph.D. in bioorganic chemistry at Washington University in St. Louis with researching in uh, protein engineering, and she completed postdoctoral research on liver disease and diabetes at Case Western Reserve in Washington University Medical School. She's helped research and management positions in both small and large biotech companies. And in her most recent position, she was director of operations for a large biotech company where she managed the site for preclinical drug testing with revenue in excess of $20 million per year. With that, I'll bring on Dr. Jeanette Hill to talk about her experiences with the SBIR program. Okay. Thank you, Hall. Um, so hello, everyone. Um, as you mentioned, I am Jeanette Hill. I am currently um, founder and CEO of Spot on Sciences, uh, which is a startup company um, based here in Austin, Texas. Um, next slide, please. And so Hall asked me to answer just a couple of questions about what it was like to, to um, be a part of the SBIR process. And the first question was, is it worth the time um, that I invested? Um, I would say absolutely yes. Um, basically, you know, from our SBIR grant, we got seed funding, and that helped us uh, develop, manufacture, and commercialize our product. Um, it was non-dilutive funding. Um, it comes as either a grant or contract, depending on the agency. And this money, um, you don't have to pay it back. It's not a loan, um, so that's great. Um, and there is no equity loss. You don't have to give any of your, your stock away. And you own the patents on this also. So, you know, this is it's really a great program. Um, you know, so why doesn't, why don't we all do that? Why don't we all fund our companies that way? Um, as, as Alan mentioned, it is very competitive. Um, you, you, know, it, you have to go through quite a bit of work and, and to answer the, the question that was asked. I mean, it's a pretty long process. Uh, you have to have quite a bit of patience. So from the time um, it takes, um, you probably, you know, at least a couple of months if you've not written one before um, to prepare a proposal. And then once you actually apply, 
um, it's probably at least, I'd say, 6 to 12 months before you can get started. And that's assuming you know, it's accepted and everything goes through. So you do have to have quite a bit of patience. Um, and you also have to find the right fit um, for an agency. I mean, you need to find an agency that will fund the type of work or the type of product that, that you want to produce. Can I next slide, please? And so I just wanted to, kind of as an example, uh, go through the, the funding that we have received. Um, so we have a um, SBIR grant from DARPA, which is the, you know, in the military research arm. Um, for phase one, um, the idea of, and what we did is show that the product idea was feasible, and we developed a working prototype from that. So we got $150,000 um, for over nine months. And then that followed on to phase two. So we showed that the, you know, the idea worked. And then we did our initial product manufacture. In our case, we made up to 10,000 pieces of our product and then put it out into the, the real world and gave it to customers and did a lot of testing, you know, kind of beat it to death and showed that it would actually work. And that was the $1 million for two years. Um, and then we were lucky enough to get a phase 2B um, that followed on that. Um, it was for two years, and it's still ongoing um, for uh, three quarters of a million dollars. And that helps us. Um, it's a commercialization focus. Um, it is helping us scale up our manufacturer to get our price points down, and also to do some field studies so we can get some of the validation data and you know, some of the, the work that we really need to, to further our commercialization. And then recently, we also got a grant from the NIH, the NHLBI. Um, this is a kind of a follow-on study. It is using the product that we developed from the, the first grant um, and for a specific um, use for cardiovascular um, diagnosis um, and assays. Next slide, please. So this is our product. Um, it's called Hemospot. Um, and basically, it's a way to take a blood sample uh, with a finger stick from home so you don't have to go in and, and have it drawn from your arm. Um, so to use this, you just stick your finger uh, with a lancet, um, put two drops of blood into the device. It goes into the filter paper, into the center there, and then it spreads out evenly. And then you close the device. And it has a desiccant um, inside. And so once it's closed, it dries the sample. And once it's dry, it's stable at room temperature for a long period of time. Um, next slide, please. And so for phase one, as I mentioned, what we did was basically show that this idea you know, would work. And then we developed a prototype. And so it's, I think when I first started, I thought, wow, this is you know, really hard. And everybody knows how to do this, and I don't. But it's basically just, if, you, if you've done a, a, a program or a project management, it's basically just laying out, you know, here's the things that we need to do. The same things that you, you do for, you know, any business plan, any, um, any project that you do. And so for, in our case, uh, our first objective was to just, you know, test the components. So we have the filter papers, we have the desiccant, we have lancets, you know, all the, the pieces of our, our, our um, product. Um, our second objective then was to develop a prototype. And if you look at the bottom, um, it's kind of amusing, but this is <laughs> from starting in 2010 um, up to the current day. And we've gone through many different versions of, of our design of our, our product. Probably there's, there's probably another uh, at least half a dozen that we're not showing here. Um, so it, it's you know, never simple, even a simple idea. It, it you know, definitely takes a lot of different uh, pieces and, and ideas and testing to, to make it work. Um, the second one um, from the left, that is actually a working prototype. So to be able to do some of the studies that we wanted to do, we you know, basically went to the hobby store, to Home Depot, uh, picked up some pieces and put them together just to show um, in, you know, in, in the lab uh, that this would work. And then the third objective uh, was to, in our case, we wanted to measure the analytes of what was in the blood. And so we did quite a bit of work uh, to show that it worked, to show that you could get good results from this. Next slide. Um, the next question uh, then was, what, what tips do I have for success? 
And basically, to write this grant, again, it's not rocket science, although sometimes maybe it is, but uh, it, just like any, anything else you do in business, you always need to sell your idea and product. Uh, the people that are reviewing this, you know, for the most part, they're very technically competent, uh, but they have a lot of work to do. They're reading a lot of these. What you really need to do is make it exciting, um, make it easy for them to understand, and, um, and convince them that it will work. So first of all, you need to you know, convince them why it is needed. And that usually goes into the uh, abstract or the introduction part of the grant. Um, and then who will buy it? So it's very important. We really need this. Um, somebody will buy it. Um, you can put that, um, again, should be an abstract. And then the commercialization plan part of the grant. And then why are you the one to do that? And so if you have expertise in that field, um, that's very important. Um, if you're fairly new to the field, um, that's not really a problem, but you probably would it'd be good to have some letters of support or some people on your team that do have a fairly deep expertise in that field. That would, that'll only help support your grant. Um, and then finally, how will you make it happen? And this is probably the most, one of the most important parts of the grant. Um, you really need to make it convincing that, yes, we know what we're doing, and here's how we will make this work. Um, that usually goes into the specific aims, also called objectives. Um, research strategy is very important. Um, you don't have to you know, go into great detail. You have a limited space, uh, but you do need to make it convincing that you know what you're doing. If things don't work perfectly the first time, uh, you have a plan then to, to make that work. And then also it's very helpful to have some preliminary data. You don't have to. Uh, but that only strengthens, it, strengthens your, your, your proposal. Um, and then also suggest a very important tip is to follow the rules. Um, they have laid out what margins, what font, page limits, what deadlines you have to do. Um, as I found out, I actually had a grant rejected within two weeks uh, because um, I used, it said Arial font, and I had used Arial narrow font. And that, it didn't have the right uh, characters per inch. And so it was rejected. So <laughs> when, when they say use this font, use that font. And also the uh, time limits. Um, at 5 o'clock PM Eastern time, if that's when they say it's going to close, then it will close then. So make sure that you're, you're on time. OK, next slide. Okay, and the final question was, uh, what were the most valuable resources that I found? Um, I find there, there's a lot of information out there. Um, you know, you're running a company, you're very busy. Um, I found email alerts. If you go to um, different websites, uh, which agencies you know, will fund the type of work that you're doing, um, sign up for email alerts for grant announcements. That's a, that's a great way to, to keep track of things. Um, Myself, I signed up for the DOD alerts, NIH, and then Zim.com um, is a very good resource for all things SBIR. Um, also, um, I've used a lot of other entrepreneurs. Um, if, if people, your friends, um, people in the same, you know, doing the same thing that you're doing, um, make sure that they know what you're doing. They're also looking at these grants. They're looking at this information. They might catch something that you would have missed. Um, in fact, the DARPA grant that we got, I probably would have missed that if one of my colleagues hadn't said, hey, you should take a look at this and, and check this out. So um, that, that can be very helpful. Um, talk to past SBIR winners, um, especially if they're working with us, as they have done work with that same agency that you're interested in. Um, each agency, um, there are a lot of similarities in SBIR programs, but there are, they, they handle things quite a bit differently also. So um, talk to people who've been through this process. They can be a very valuable resource. And then program managers. Um, when you read the, um, the request for a, a proposal, um, the program, they always list a program manager. And I would definitely call them um, at least a month or two months before you start on a proposal. Um, talk to them about what you plan to do, and just get their feedback on does this idea really fit for what they are asking for. Um, NIH, the requirements are a bit looser. They're looking for more um, research type um, grants, and they're, they're a bit more open. Um, for the DOD, uh, they usually have very 
pretty narrow requirements, and they can tell you right off if, if, that, if your, your project is going to work. And it can save you a lot of time. If it's, if it's not a good fit, then you know, it's probably you're better off not, not working on that one and, and finding another one. Um, and then we've used commercialization resources. And as Alan mentioned, um, we have, for us, has mainly been um, phase two. Um, but it's been very helpful for getting us connections, um, helping us put our quad chart together, um, just you know, getting connected to people who could use our product. Um, next slide. Oh, that's it. And I just wanted to mention that I will be um, at the SBI conference um, in Austin um, on a panel, and I'm very happy to talk to anybody um, and answer any questions. Thank you. Well, thank you, Jeanette. Thank you, Alan, for your explanations and discussions there. It was very helpful. Several questions have come in as you guys were both speaking. The first question was, Alan, or the audience wants to know if they can get a copy of the slides. Absolutely. And so we'll, um, we'll provide the slides to everybody afterwards and uh, both sets there. Thank you guys for that. The, the next question that came in is, oh, you know, it goes to Dr. Jeanette Hill. How many hours did you spend on developing the uh, the application? Mm -hmm. um, so, if it's the first time that you're doing an application, um, I would suggest doing just a phase one. There is also a phase one combined with the phase two, and that takes quite a bit longer to put together. Um, the first one that I did, you know, I it's going to take you quite a bit longer because there's there's a lot of things you have to get in place. You have to have, um, you know, uh, a, a Dun and Bradstreet number. You have to have different things, a um, couple different things set up for your company and and for the the pro, the um, SBI or program. So make sure you get started at least a couple of months ahead of time. Um, putting it together, it's it's. A, the same kind of work that you do anyway for a business plan or, or a project plan. So it, it's not wasted work, um, but it does, you know, it, if you hadn't done that already, it does take some time. So I, if it's the first time, I would give yourself at least two months um, to, to put things together. Okay. Let me offer a couple of resources quickly for that. The official resource is that of the Small Business Administration. It's sbir.gov and it will give you a um, certain amount of information that can help you in, um, in preparing for proposal development. The unofficial resource that, um, that Jeanette just mentioned, zyn.com, Z-Y-N.com, that is a gold mine. That's a really invaluable resource. It's got a lot of information in it, including information about phase zero programs. I mentioned this before, and if you're fortunate enough to live in a state that offers a phase zero program, Google phase zero programs, by the way, and you, you will get to sites that tell you which states have um, uh, phase zero programs and, and which ones don't. Go to your local small business development center as well. They will tell you whether there's a, whether there's a formal uh, phase zero program. That can be invaluable in helping you develop your proposal. Great, great. We did have a question about the upcoming conference. For those of us unable to spend 445 for the full summit, do you recommend just attending Tuesday's sessions at 150? What was your Absolutely. thought there, Alan? Absolutely. We worked hard to get the very best tutors that we could find um, to uh, to have these to, to have these sessions. Um, I would recommend the session on financial management. Um, I would recommend highly recommend the session on proposal development. Um, the guy that teaches that is uh, is just one of the best in the uh, in one of the best in the business, and that'll be a continuing resource for you. Um, the last of the tutorials, and these are three-hour tutorials, and they're going to be repeated. So, if you can go um, for that first day, um, you can go to one tutorial in the morning. You can go to another tutorial in the afternoon. And you'll walk away with um, with the rudiments of, of what you need to get started with the SBR program. Right. And by the way, um, contact you know there are discounts that are out there and are available. Um, contact your local SBDC and see if they have information on on uh, on discounts for um, the uh, conference. Right. Yeah, I, I would also I would also recommend um, talking to the program managers. There are one to one meetings that you can set up. And this is a great time to talk to them, tell them what you're doing, 
and they can help you know to let you know if if your your program is going to be a fit for them. Um, also, I, I have had some good, really good luck just going and, and showing uh, these these program managers like, look, this is what we're doing. You know, how could how could it work? And we've actually had some come back and connect us to different groups. And and sometimes you'll even um, see a new if they don't have a current proposal for that, you will give them an idea, and they might come out with a proposal in the next round for essentially what you're doing. Just to underscore what Jeanette just said. Um, this is a comment on timeliness. Most federal agencies that offer SBR programs are going to be coming out with a whole new, fresh set of topics in the month of December. It's especially true of the Department of Defense, but it's true of many of the other agencies as well, um, including the National Institutes of Health, which uh, have open solicitations that are out there right now. So that um, if you can come to, even if it's just the first day, but if you can come to the whole National SBR conference, in November, you can do the homework that you need in order to determine whether or not you're ready to get your feet wet and jump into the pool in December and submit your first SBR or FTTR application. Great. The next question is, uh, aside from the wrong font, what's the, the main reasons why applications are, are not accepted? Alan, what's your thought on that? Um, not following the, I just nailed it, not following the instructions. and it's. Um, she talked about the detailed instructions. Yes, that can get you in trouble, um, but there are also there 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 are there are substantial and substantive instructions that each agency provides when you go to the agency's website um, in order to get down into the weeds in terms of the topics that that agency makes available. That agency will also offer proposal development instructions. And make sure you read those carefully, because they will tell you um, what the deal breakers and the deal makers um, are with respect to uh, with respect to applications. So do your homework and follow the rules. Yeah. The next question is: Can you describe more about uh, Phase Zero awards? What are those? So let me give you an example. I mean, there's a couple folks on the phone from um, Virginia. Um, there is a um, a state. Um, uh, organization that's headquartered up in the statewide in terms of um, the services that they provide, but they're headquartered um, up in the Dulles Corridor, <laughs> and um, um, that the organization offers a Phase Zero program, um, which uh, is it's available online, and there are also face-to-face um, uh, -face classes that are available where they will walk you through the process of phase of uh, proposal development. Now, most states offer, and states that offer phase one programs usually have those as the components in it. It's how to find topics that are relevant to you when that happens um, in terms of the calendar year, and then what you need to do to be able to compete successfully, what the elements of, of a proposal are. The best of the phase zero workshops um, that I've ever seen are workshops in which um, you walk in the door knowing what topic you would like to respond to with a proposal, and you walk out the door at the end of maybe a day, a full day long, an eight-hour day, or at the end of two days with the, with the rudiments of the proposal itself. You know what the outline looks like. You know what things you have to cover in each of the elements within the outline, and um, you know what the nature and the quality of the content has to be. So those are phase zero programs. The next question is, how long does it take for the award to be established? It's, uh, Jeanette, you can take a shot at that. I mean, what I've seen is that um, there's, there's variation across the federal government in terms of agency responses. Um, it can be as little as a couple of months. It can be as much as, as six months or even more. What I will say is that all agencies, um, by congressional mandate, are now working to reduce the amount of time to award, to reduce the amount of time between um, your being informed that you won an award and the time you actually receive the money and you can get started. I'll say in my experience, the Department of Defense is much faster. I think that process was less than six months to, you know, to application the, the funding. Um, for NIH, it can be up to a year. Takes a bit longer. 
Okay. Well, that leads to our next question, which is, what's the difference between the, the different departments? Which, which are easier to work with, which are harder to work with? What's your take on that, Alan? Um, gee, it's hard to answer in terms of which ones are easier and which ones are harder. I mean, what you'll find is, um, and I think Jeanette just referenced this, the Department of Defense is usually um, through the individual agencies and, um, and sub-agencies, we call them components within the Department of Defense. Um, topics usually um, are closer to um, operational needs. They may not be today's needs. They may be needs that will be three years or five years down the road. But um, most of the DOD agencies and components have a fairly clear idea of what kinds of solutions that they're looking for. They will allow for a lot of variation in how you provide that solution, but they will be fairly clear on what their requirement sets are. But you know, you can go to agencies that are quite small in comparison. You know, for example, um, I'd use the Department of Agriculture, and the Department of Agriculture likewise is um, they're fairly clear on what their priorities are and what the needs um, that uh, they have on behalf um, of the agricultural community that's out there. Um, other agencies like NIH, as Jeanette said, um, paint with a much broader brush. Um, NIH and the National Science Foundation can put out topics that are much more um, general. Let me make a suggestion for people that want to know how to, how to do this. If you go to zyn.com, zyn.com as we've mentioned and is referenced in the slide decks there, um, there is a topic search field that you can find. My suggestion is if you want to see what's relevant to you and what topics that are out there are relevant to your expertise, your area of expertise, just type in a few words that summarizes your area of technical expertise as a scientist or an engineer and then click search and that will bring up a number of topics from different kinds of agencies. And you can compare and contrast right there and then you'll see the difference in specificity between the Department of Energy topic, a National Science Foundation topic, and a uh, Department of Defense topic. The last thing that I'll mention is um, we have uh, on the, if you go to the website for the National SBIR conference, again it's um, <coughs> www.nationalspirconference.com dot com, um, you'll see a, a number of what we call posters. These are one-page um, icons uh, in which agencies describe their key differences from one another in terms of what their SBIR programs offer. So there's a variety of resources out there that can answer that question for you. Great. Well, thank you so much for that. That wraps up our questions, and we are at the end of our hour. I want to thank you, Alan. Thank you, uh, Jeanette, for sharing your information with our audience today. And I want to thank the audience for spending time with us. We will send you a copy of the slides, and we will have a recording available. With that, we'll go ahead and wrap it up. Any closing words of uh, wisdom from you, Alan? Uh, don't be afraid to compete. Come on down. Uh, make every effort possible to come to the National SBIR Conference in Austin in November. And uh, let's see you in the winner's category. Uh, Jeanette, anything from your side? I would say that the hardest thing is just getting started. Don't be afraid of it. Um, everybody can do it. If I can do it, anybody can do it. Um, but you just need to get started, and you'll you'll figure it out as you go along. Great. With that, we'll go ahead and wrap it up. Thank you guys for joining us today, and we we'll hope to see you at the conference. Talk to you soon.